you step to this? Face the pain, no escape. Can you step to this? Face the pain. Face the pain, no escape. Can you step to this? What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Fixed Fights Podcast with Kurt and Ben. As always, I'm Kurt. I'm here with my main man, Ben. And Ben, this week is probably one of our biggest shows. There is so much to talk about. I couldn't even contain myself when we were uh, <laughs> turning this on. I feel like we talked about a bunch of stuff before we even turned this on. But I'm excited, man. What a big weekend that was. Yeah, I'm excited, too. I'm happy that we got a lot of stuff to talk about. I'm happy that there's a lot of fallout from this UFC event. And I'm happy that we got two you have, between UFC and Bellator coming up this week. Like, plenty to talk about. Um, just, like, in cage action, out of cage action. There's a lot going on in MMA. Yeah, there is. But none bigger than the results from this weekend's main event. It was Khabib Nurmagomedov defeating Justin Gaethje in the second round via triangle choke. And then he threw a bombshell on us. He retired after the fight. But uh, before we get into uh, Khabib's retirement and wish him well, let's first talk about the action in the cage. Um, man, actually, actually, I want to I wanna back it up. Uh, let's go the day before the fight. Did you? I'm sure. I don't know if you have to ask. I'm sure you saw Scale Gate, right? Mm-hmm. Of course. Um, did you have any strong opinions or thoughts on that? I mean, I thought it looked a little shady. And it's like, how is the UFC still messing up the way in? So, if anybody listening doesn't know, it's like, right, Khabib. And I think I got to kind of talk through it to make sure I understand what happened. But Khabib stands on the scale, releases the towel raises his arms and the UFC or whoever's working the scale lets it just raise ever so slightly and then immediately like clears the scale which I'm sure you did this Kurt kids wrestling you fucking stand on that scale raise your hands up and make it make it like wobble even though it's not the actual weight I don't know the physics behind it but I mean it looks shady I think the bigger question here is like how are they still letting guys get away with this like tomfoolery at weigh-ins I mean, just buy a digital scale, right? I don't know why they still use, yeah, legit. you know, this, like, what seems like an archaic way yeah. of weigh-ins, you know, in 2020 with digital scales and, and you know what I'm saying? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think I think the system was gamed a little bit. You know, it definitely looked like it was on its way up, especially if you watch that slow down video, but I don't care. You know yeah, what I'm saying? Same. Like, That's it. I, I, don't, I care. don't care. We got the fight yeah. that we needed to get. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. We got the fight. I, and I'm going to be honest with you. If Khabib was told, hey, like, you're a pound overweight, you got to go back and cut another pound. I don't know if he would have been able to. Like, he did not look that good. And, uh, you know, so, sometimes that it, it affects fighters, sometimes it doesn't, right? We've seen guys look like death on the scale, and the next day, you know, they're all-stars, right? And we've seen it the opposite way. Um, but it kind of fed into to my Gaethje belief, man. You know, I said it last week. I've been saying it the whole time. I was pretty damn confident in Gaethje. And that was nothing on Khabib or a skill set, but I just thought, uh, I don't know. I just, I just, I had that one way in my mind. I thought Gaethje yeah. was going to be able to clip him. And, uh, you know, he did have some success in the fight. I thought the first round was very interesting. I thought both guys had their moments. I thought Gaethje was definitely putting in work with his leg kicks. Um, he was landing some big punches. He had Khabib on the back foot a little bit, but towards the end of the round, Khabib came back. His pressure started to mount. He gets the takedown in the at the end of the first round, and uh, you can kind of you you kind of got the sense of where this fight might be going, because <clears throat> in the first round I believe he took him down and passed, you know, guard within what a matter of like ten seconds. Right. And right. the round on top. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, how how did you score the first round? I thought Khabib won it on the strength of that. Like, I mean, yeah, Gaethje did hurt him, but um, I don't know. You know, it's not like Khabib went down or anything. I think, man, I mean, I, w- I picked Khabib. Um, I thought he was a bigger favorite than he deserved to be, but I think I was wrong in that regard because I was like, I was shocked how about midway through the first round and you, you kind of described it, Khabib started putting Gaethje on the back foot. Like I was pretty shocked that Gaethje seemed to be so affected by Khabib's pressure so quickly um, and it was it was like about midway through the first round when Khabib made the, his first like attempt at grappling and and Gaethje did defend that takedown, I believe. Um, but just that small bit of grappling seemed to either really give Gaethje a ton of hesitation or like drain him. But 
even watching it, knowing that I expect, like I thought Khabib was going to win, knowing it, I was totally shocked by how easily he was able to pressure Gaethje. And I think that's a credit to to Khabib that like even a guy like Justin Gaethje saw Khabib Nurmagomedov like pressuring him and thinks, oh shit, I got to move away. Um, that that really surprised me. I think we've just seen it like his whole career, right? Like, you know, Khabib has never been the best striker. He's never been the cleanest striker, but he's able to win striking exchanges with these these yeah. high level strikers just because of his pressure and the threat of the takedown, right? I mean, we saw him knock down Connor and, and better Connor in stretches of that fight. Uh, you know, we saw him, you know, go to toe to toe with a bunch of guys <clears throat> that uh, I just think it's the wrestling man and the threat of that wrestling. And, you know, his overall grappling that makes guys tentative and uh, he can offset that skill difference. Yeah. And I mean, he's like also like a freaking incredible athlete. Right. Yeah. I think he, he he's super fast. He, both his hands are super fast. But my God, his shot is so like how often do you see that? I feel like a lot of times in MMA, the best takedown artists are guys that, yeah, they're fast, but they have really, really good timing. And yep. Khabib has both. Khabib has timing and like blazing speed with his shot. The way he turns the corner on on like double legs, man, he is fast. And we talked about it last week. It's his chain wrestling too. You know, it's it's a lot of times it's not the first shot. He's not a guy that's gonna like blast double through you or anything like that. But he's just relentless. If you stuff his first shot, he's back in on the second. Like you said, he's turning the corner. And if we jump ahead to the second round, when I first saw the finish. I thought that Gaethje kind of got lazy on his takedown defense. And then when I rewatched the way that Khabib got that last takedown, it's just like you said, the way he turns the corner, the way he comes up, the way he keeps driving through his shots, it wasn't Gaethje being lazy. He, you know, he, he got on, he brought his hips up, he turned the corner and yet, you know, Gaethje didn't necessarily move after that, which allowed Khabib to, to shoot right up his back and get those hooks in. But yeah, I mean, at first, I thought it was Khabib or Gaethje being a little bit lazy and conceding the takedown, but no, that was all Khabib, man. Uh, awesome technique. Yeah, yeah, really incredible technique. I thought Gaethje did look a little like I was under impressed with Gaethje's ground game. I I think that's fair to say. Like I expected. That's, that's an understatement. I expected a lot more. Um, I mean, I guess you know, I don't want to knock him too much because he's fighting like I think probably the best grappler overall in MMA right now. Um, or used to be if, if Khabib is retired. But yeah, I mean, the takedowns came quite easily, it seemed, for for Khabib. And then on the on the actual ground, I don't know what, you know, Gaethje was several steps behind. Sure, you're, you're facing a great grappler, but I mean, you got to be a, a much more prepared with your submission defense, I would think. Um, and I don't know if that's just how he's always been, and we haven't really seen anybody really, really try to test Gaethje's grappling, or if it's more a credit to Khabib or what, but... I do think, like, even watching him in the the grappling exchanges in slow motion, you realize Khabib is, like, two or three steps ahead of Gaethje, right? Gaethje is, like, starting his escape of a position that Khabib has already blown through um, in those exchanges. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I was disappointed in Gaethje's grappling. Not that I expected him to, like, throw up a fucking triangle or anything, but I expected him to be really, really careful of the submission threat. Um, and I think we kind of... we we think of Khabib a lot as a incredible ground and pound artist. And he might, he is like maybe the best in the world at ground and pound. But like, I think he showed here his overall grappling game submissions. We've even seen him, I think once in the UFC, he's fought off his back and looked really good. So just overall, I think he's a, a pretty incredible grappler. Yeah, he really is. And, and yeah, I echo your sentiment. Uh, disappointment is a good word. And yeah, we, you know, we've never seen Gaethje really put into like any like long stretches of grappling exchange. We've seen him have to get up from the takedowns. And that's that's why I was a little bit disappointed because, you know, we've seen him taken down before, obviously not by a takedown artist uh, at the skill level of Khabib, but he's always shown explosiveness. He's always shown a good get up game. And this was just not evident here. He almost kind of accepted the positions. And again, I think a lot of that is a testament to Khabib, that finishing sequence where he jumped to Gaethje's back. There's not much Gaethje's going to be able to do there, mm -hmm. right? But some of the other exchanges... You know, few and far between, but yeah, and even even the finishing exchange, you know, the knowledge just didn't look there. Yeah, the knowledge. I think that's a, a good way to that he like didn't really seem to um, react. I'm not saying he could have necessarily got out of that the the triangle and the arm bar, like that combo. There, yeah, that there was no reaction though. But yeah, he didn't look like he really knew what he was doing. Even in the wrestling exchanges, I guess what I'm trying to say is like 
it just felt like Khabib, once he gets a hold of you, he's running through steps two, three, four, five, six, seven to like get to mount or your back. And Gaethje is just stuck on one still in yeah. those exchanges where he's thinking, how do I defend the takedown? Well, it's too late. Khabib has mounted me. Um, right. so, so yeah, let, I think disappointed in, in Gaethje for sure. Let me ask you this. Do you think it, it's a possibility that Gaethje was so focused on solely the takedown they only work, let's say, like his get-up game. He's striking his get-up game, and he put no real time into actually grappling on the mat and if grappling I, from different positions. Now, obviously, I don't know. I have no idea how he's training day-to-day. But if I were to completely guess, uh, an, an educated guess, it's not a total speculation, I would say, I would guess he trained a ton with Kamaru Usman and thought, I'm really well-prepared because Usman is a bigger just as good of a wrestler or takedown artist. But Usman does not have the back take game. Usman does not have the guard passing game that Khabib does. So I think he thought, I'm going to be really, really well prepared against big, strong wrestlers. And he did his best in that regard. But yeah, once it was actually on the mat, I think Khabib just blew through him in terms of like actual submission, jujitsu, whatever you want to call it, skill. Yeah, I mean, Khabib... uh... Khabib was going for the kill in this fight, right? You know, we saw it in the first round. He went for a late submission... Um, and then we saw it in the second round, obviously with that triangle. And I mean, the way he set up that triangle was pure beauty. I mean, that's like textbook, just basic, effective jujitsu. The way he isolates the arm, gets the S mount, sets up the triangle, even gives up his back. You know, you, you might've thought Khabib would want to maybe stay on top and may possibly look for, you know, the mounted triangle with ground to pound and like that arm bar, uh, you know, you can go for a straight arm bar off of that, but no, he went to his back, locks it up, cinches it tight. Um, dude, that was that was pure beauty. His his grappling is at a super high level that I don't think we've necessarily seen until the last couple fights. Like if you look at his last three fights, all submissions, I think we've really just seen like an evolution in not just his wrestling game, but his grappling game as a whole. Man, it's really impressive. Yeah, for sure. And I kind of get the sense, man. Like looking back at, at the Khabib Connor fight, I kind of get the sense Khabib wanted to punch McGregor there. Yeah. Like he was he was not whereas here he was way more and that might have been I'm not saying it was um animosity toward McGregor. I think Khabib probably thought I'm not gonna wear out Gaethje with strikes. Let me try to kill him every time we're on the mat with a submission. Whereas right. with McGregor, he probably knew it's fine if I don't submit him here. I'm draining his gas tank. I'm gonna as long as I'm beating him up, I'm gonna win. Exactly. Um, so it did seem like, yeah, like you said, he went, he was going straight for the kill every time it was on the mat, which I fucking love to see as a fan. Some somebody who gets on the mat, um, and yeah, they punch, but they also think, how can I pass the guard? How can I get on top? How can I get this guy's back? All those things, and, and Khabib did it with a friggin' quickness. Yeah, I mean, it, the guy just has like, like his functional strength must be just so strong. I mean, like. You know, ESPN put out a put out a little um, article the other day, and they did a couple interviews with like Khabib's past opponents. I think all of them in his last like six or seven sans McGregor, because obviously you're not going to get that interview, right? <laughs> but uh, you know, like three or four of the guys had the same comment. It was like he was stuck in cement. Like you just cannot shake his base. His base is so strong. Um, he's opportunistic, like you said. He's super quick. There's always the threat of the ground and pound. He's added the submission element. I mean. And then, and then you look at the feet. Yeah, he's not the most technical striker, but when's the last time Khabib lost a battle on the feet? We've seen him. We've seen him on stretches on the feet. It's just uh, the guy's a complete fighter, man. I mean, dude, the the proof is in the pudding, right? Like, yes, sometimes even Poirier threw a few punches, and Khabib looked out of sorts in that fight. Like, yes, he looks bad at times on the feet, but he's twenty nine and zero. He still gets the fight to the mat. He still does imposes his will. So yeah, he doesn't have perfect striking, but um, you know, he he is it's effective. That's the only measure that matters, um, Very is effective. winning. And he's there. Dude, just going back a little bit, when you were describing how Khabib has, it feels like you're in cement, his base, he's super athletic. All I was thinking was you could also be saying that about Michael Chandler, and that is now a fight that I like desperately want to see. Yeah, obviously we're not gonna get it, but um Man, I kind of, it makes me wish Chandler would have fought Khabib before Khabib totally retired. Because, um, man, the, the matchup of wrestling and grappling there would be everything I want in a fight, basically. Yeah, man. Uh, Chandler is such a big part of that division. And, yeah, I mean, you know, it brings it, – it, it's it's kind of a sad thing, right? Like, okay, so let's 
how how shocked were you when Khabib took off the gloves and said, "This is it for me. This is my last fight." I was pretty shocked, but like I didn't expect it at all. I don't think we talked about it, and I don't think no. anybody talked about it. I was shocked in that regard, but as soon as he started to like do it, as soon as it became real, oh, he's retiring. Like it made sense. I was like, I yeah. it's gonna be something with his father. I know for sure. Like this is, and it, I think it's gonna stick. Don't you? Like I do. Yeah, it feels, I, I feels very real. You know, he was talking about one more fight, so so we knew it was coming. Um, he doesn't seem like the guy, you know, he's not in it for money. He said, he's like, I beat Ga- uh, Poirier, I beat Connor. I choked them both out. He just beat Gaethje. Yeah, we never we never got the Tony fight, but I think uh, I think in Khabib's mind, and I think a lot of people's mind, like, that, that fight kind of set sail once Gaethje beat Tony, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and for me personally, like, I don't need to see the GSP fight. Um, GSP at 40 years old... Who knows what weight they're going to fight at. You know, I don't need to see that. So it makes, yeah, like you said, it makes a ton of sense. But at the same time, it's very bittersweet. I'm very happy for him. I think it's the right move for him. He's retiring on top. But, dude, you just look at these names, man. <laughs> Michael Chandler. Yeah, Tony Ferguson. Uh, dude, there's so many names. Connor rematch. I mean, lightweight is stacked. And losing a guy in Khabib who's what? He's uh, 31 or 32 years old now. Not sure. And so a guy that has not taken a lot of damage in his career, right? Like, yeah, he has 29 fights. He's 32 years old. Um, you know, we're losing him at, at the prime, prime of his career. We've never seen, like, any sort of slowdown in skill. We've seen him get better and better and better. And, uh, yeah, we're losing him right in the prime of his career, so it's a bit bittersweet, man. Yeah, I mean, outside of – there are, like, lightweight is a killer's – is a is a shark tank as it always is. But outside of Chandler, like now – there's honestly not a, a bunch of other lightweights that I'd be super excited that like are up and coming that I think would be competitive with Khabib. Um, no disrespect to guys like the like Dan Hooker, or Charles Oliveira, Paul Felder. I think that Khabib is on a totally different level than them. So I think he also like he knows he's a smart guy. I think he also kind of had the same thought that I just did, where it's like I'm gonna beat these biggest names, and if I go out now, it's you know I've the, the the job has been done essentially. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's crazy, man. It, it really is. Um, it, so there's so many different avenues we have to go and we have to talk about, um, you know, I think, I think this where we should go is the legacy part. Right. And a lot, you know, Khabib said in his interview, he wants to be the number one pound for pound fighter. He deserves <laughs> it. Right. Um, and again, like pound for pound, I don't know how people get mad and upset about these pound for pound arguments, right? It's all opinionated. My pound for pound list can be different from yours, and the basis for my lift can be for my list can be a hundred percent different than yours, right? So like mm. everyone's like bugging out about it, but uh where you know, where does Khabib fit on your pound for pound list? Did he overtake like a John Jones for number one or you know like I mean for for right now, I think you like why not, I guess. I think all time, like for me, GSP is still my goat. And I guess I that, honest, that's where we should go. Like all time, I don't, all time, I still put John Jones above him. I still put um, uh, GSP above him. I still probably might even put a guy like Aldo or Mighty Mouse, like for maybe not Mighty Mouse, um, just based on strength of competition, but. For as dominant as Khabib was in the UFC and as good as he's looked and as tough as the division is, he's actually, like, somewhat light on, like, staying power at the top of the division. All those guys I just named, the John Jones, uh, the John Jones, John Jones, uh, GSP, Mighty Mouse, Anderson Silva, all those guys had long extended runs at the top of the division. And yes, they had... Their competition had like Chel Sonnen in there, right? Their their competition had lower steps down in competition for sure, uh, but they just had these long runs at the top. Whereas, yeah, Khabib has been really, really good um, in a really, really good division, but it's really just been his past like three fights that have been, you know, elite, elite. I would say. Yeah, it, well, that's the thing. He's he's thirteen and zero in the UFC, right? Um, I would say the biggest names on his resume are obviously the last three, Gaethje, Poirier, McGregor. The Iaquinta win is solid. Not the biggest, though. Barbosa, again, same thing. Dos Anjos is a big win. Um, Obviously, Dos Anjos would go on to be a UFC champion. 
and also challenged for, I believe, an interim belt up at 170. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, other than that, it's it's pretty thin, man. And you look at guys like John Jones, for example. You know, I'm always a John Jones homer, but I got to say it. Uh, John Jones has more title wins than uh, fights for Khabib in the UFC. Um, but that being said, I think the way he ended his career and the skill set as a whole, um, being 29-0, and that is absolutely unheard of. I think he gets a seat at that upper echelon, that upper table with John Jones, with George St. Pierre. Um, I would probably slide Khabib into a, probably number three at this point um, behind John Jones. And John Jones' career is not written yet. Um, you know, Anderson's up there. Uh, DC's up there. Stipe's probably up there. But uh, yeah, I, I would seat him up at that upper echelon table. I mean, I don't, I don't know if I'm ready to say that, but... I will say this three fight run finishing Conor McGregor, finishing Dustin Poirier and finishing Justin Gaethje is among the best like in, in the sport. If you were to pick three fights from John Jones's career or three fights from anybody from Fedor's career, this three fight run, I think rivals anybody else's because yeah. I mean, I would like Gaethje had looked incredible, incredible. right? Poirier had looked incredible. Even McGregor, you know, he often gets overrated but he was a super, super serious threat to Khabib. So um, this this little three-fight run, though, I think is, is going to be pretty hard to beat for anybody. Yeah, it is. And and like we said before, he does not seem like a guy that is going to go back. You know what I'm saying? Uh, yeah. He has no interest in the Connor fight. You can't wait a year or two for GSP because GSP is, is the north side <laughs> yeah. of 40 now. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's not like... GSP is 37 and you might have a couple more years to kind of sit on it. That time is going to pass. And, uh, you know, like you said, none of these guys are getting excited and, uh, yeah, it, it's bittersweet, but man could be definitely, uh, one of the best to ever do it. And guys online, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, wherever you're arguing, see this, we just had a little disagreement on a part of all this and we still like each other. Uh -huh. um, somehow it's somehow, right. It's all, <laughs> Dude, I'm, I got Cole Conrad in my top five pound for pound. So Cole Conrad's a G man. <laughs> yeah. That's some respect on that man's name. That's, that's another guy that retired early, you know, like way early. On top, undefeated on top yeah. and undefeated. Yeah. Legit. Crazy. Um, let's talk about the flip side of this and, and, and the aftermath in the division. Cause now this division is wide open, right? Um, I think you got the four guys at the top. You have Dustin Poirier, Conor McGregor, Justin Gaethje, Michael Chandler, and then you got a couple heathens right behind there, the Dan Hookers, the Charles Oliveras of the world, Paul Felders. Um, how do you match up the top of this division? Let me see if I got this this all sorted out correct in my head. Um, I think the UFC, I think this is what the UFC is going to do, and I don't hate it. I'm not sure if they should do this, but I think they're going to do McGregor versus Poirier for the now vacant UFC lightweight title because that's a – any fight with Conor McGregor is automatically basically the biggest fight in MMA. Give him a title, a chance at a title. Poirier, the rematch. I think that's a great, obviously, Poirier wants that fight. He's been angling for it. Um, I think that's that makes sense for the uh, now vacant title. Um, and then I, I would like to see Ferguson. Let me see. I'm looking at the rankings. Ferguson against Chandler because Chandler recently... Um, Basically, he was straight up asked, what fight would you like if you don't get this fight? And he's angling for a Tony Ferguson fight. I think that makes a ton of sense. The UFC wants to see Chandler up there amongst the title. Um, and if he wins, that's great. He can fight Conor McGregor or um, Dustin Poirier next. And if he loses, I got no problem slotting Tony Ferguson in there either. I think Gaethje is the guy who maybe gets the biggest step back, but not a big one. And I think Gaethje should be fighting Dan Hooker next, who needs a fight. And that's... Uh, you know, a slobber knocker. Yeah. So, so I'm going to do you one better. I agree with you on the top two. Uh, I think they are going to do the Connor versus Poirier fight. Um, again, we were kind of saying last week, we, we don't think anything's going to be signed until this fight happens. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and could be winning and then retiring completely leaves the door open for Connor. Right. I, I don't see any reason why they wouldn't do Poirier versus Connor for the strap. And I don't see any reason why Connor would not accept that fight. Um, Tony versus Chandler, absolutely put them on the same card, headline it with the title fight, co-main event, 
Chandler versus Tony. If anything happens in the main event, you slide him right in. If not, you got your top four guys and you got them all. Um, and you're, you're, you're right there. And you're, you're introducing uh, Michael Chandler on the same stage as Conor McGregor. Yeah, absolutely. So, like, people need to know who Michael Chandler is. And just in case he sets himself up for a McGregor fight, they've already got those guys probably talking to each other during press conferences. Yeah. So. And then, and then Gaethje, you know, I think, I think, I like the the hooker idea. I think Gaethje's kind of, kind of, he is going to kind of wait it out for now. I think there's a possibility he could be slid right back into a title fight. Um, you know, I think he could also fight the loser of either of those two fights, um, which would be big. Um, and man, I do, I say it all, all the time. Let's dude, let's not forget Charles Oliveira. If we don't get yeah. Justin Gaethje, Dan Hooker, give me Charles Oliveira, Dan Hooker. Dude, I was thinking, we were talking earlier about Gaethje's grappling being disappointing. I bet a guy like Charles Oliveira was looking at that thinking, yeah. I can choke this guy out in a quick – honestly, even Michael Chandler might be thinking that. that with how quickly Khabib took him down, I think Michael Chandler might have seen that and think and thought, I could beat Justin Gaethje with with, rest, with uh, wrestling and back takes. I want to see Chandler versus Gaethje too. Yeah. Like all these <laughs> fights are fucking – they're great, man. But, dude, Ch uh, Chandler specifically called for Tony Ferguson, and that's the way to do it, dude. He's like calling for a hard fight, a fun fight right out the gate, which I love. So, so I have to ask this too, and he deserves that, right? Mm -hmm. You got to ask this. Like, let's say it is Connor versus Dustin, right? If Connor wins, again, we talked about this a couple weeks ago. Is Connor going to become a UFC champion, right? That is going to be willing to defend his title and not have all the bullshit, right? Like, <laughs> or or is he going to still do the bullshit? Because like, as great as Khabib was, Khabib didn't fight often, right? And this division is so bottlenecked at the top. Like, we need to get these fights to start churning. Like, I don't know if Connor is like the guy for that. Cause Connor could win the title and log jam it back up right again. Whereas opposed to like if a Dustin Poirier, Justin Gaethje, Michael Chandler type guy wins it. I feel like we're going to get a lot more um, of the ball rolling more often. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Oh no. If, if Connor McGregor wins the title, he's not going to fight Michael Chandler. Like there's no way that's going to happen. I mean, maybe I guess, but I mean, I, I'm assuming that yeah, McGregor fights for a belt um, but there is zero guarantees he ever defends that belt. Which I is mean, which is crazy, man. There's still a third Nate Diaz fight out there at 170 that I'm sure he wants to make. Um, so yeah, I would like everything is off the table with McGregor. But I do think I think both you and I obviously agree that um, the fight to make for the title is is McGregor against Poirier. Ben, this time next year, October 2021, <laughs> who is the champion at 155 in the UFC? Um, man, you put me on the fucking spot. Charles Oliveira. Wow. He has, Ooh. I mean, if, if I'm talking skill set, I think a lot of these guys, I think Gaethje is going to fall off a cliff. Unfortunately, I think Poirier is bigger and brighter pastures. I think Ferguson has fallen off a cliff. I think McGregor is going to be MIA. I think Charles Oliveira has some shocking skill sets. I'm not saying he's going to be a popular champion, but I think he, like I could see him weaseling his way into a fight and people are just totally sleep on his skill set on how dangerous he is. Like, I'm not joking. I think I might pick Charles Oliveira to beat Justin Gaethje just based on the grappling disparity that apparently exists. The man's won eight fights in a row. And uh, I it feel happens. like we're the only two people uh, saying his name <laughs> every week. Um, I'm going to go Conor McGregor. Yeah. I really think, I still think Conor is that dude. Everything I've seen from him sans the Khabib fight, he's that guy. His timing is still there. He's still got that it factor. I just, again, the big question is, is he going to, you know, be that guy that's going to take the fights and defend that title? I don't know. Uh, I want to think he is, but if I'm looking at the skill sets of all these guys, you take Khabib out of that. I mean, these are all strikers, right? What guy is out striking Connor? Uh, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, dude, I'm picking – I early prediction, if if he does fight Poirier, I'm picking Connor to beat Poirier again. I think he, he's too fast. His timing is too good. And um, his kicking game like that he showed against Cowboy is really good. Like I, I have no reason to think he wouldn't be able to beat Poirier again as much as Poirier has evolved. Yeah. I mean, I hope we get to see it, man. I, I'm really hoping that, you know, let's give Khabib his moment. But uh, 
man, what next two, three weeks, we got to build this fight up. Let's get this yeah. fight damn signed. Both yeah. these fights, get these damn fights signed. It's time. It's time. UFC, yeah, there's no, no reason, whatever. No reason for him to not happen for sure. Conor McGregor, Dustin Poirier for the strap. Michael Chandler, Tony Ferguson, Comain injected into the veins. <laughs> um, all right, let's jump to the co-main event. Robert Whitaker, y'all must have forgot, uh, defeats Jared Cannonier by unanimous decision. Uh, I think we both were kind of confused uh, of the, the – almost a disrespect to Robert Whitaker, right? Like this fight, first of all, flew under the radar, and second of all, like I was shocked to see the line so close, man. Uh, you know, it being a pick with Jared Cannonier. I think Robert Whitaker's body of work – I mean, he's won his last uh, 11 out of 12 fights, that lone losses to Israel Adesanya, who is pretty damn good. Um, and Robert Whitaker looked really good in this fight. Um, he looked clean on the feet, stayed out of big trouble, hurts Cannoneer. Uh, yeah, impressive stuff from Robert Whitaker. Dude, if, if you stand in front of Robert Whitaker and you are not named Yoel Romero, Whitaker's going to fucking style on you. His jab looked so good. He was throwing like a step-in jab that would like, pop Cannoneer's head back. He was throwing a jab on a pivot. He was throwing it double jabs. And then once he got, once he got uh, Cannoneer's head moving to either side, he's throwing that head kick. Um, and dude, hot take. I think Robert Whitaker has one of the best head kicks in MMA right now. Um, he hurt Yoel Romero with it. He finished Jacare Souza with it. He landed it on Darren Till. And here he almost finished Jared Cannoneer with it. Absolutely. Uh, Pretty beautiful performance from from Whitaker and Cannonier, tough as hell. Like yeah, very he tough. Did he when when I was watching it live when he got dropped? I swear to God, he said something like, "I'm ready to die in here." To Whitaker, like was talking back to him as he was getting his ass. I didn't kicked. I didn't catch that, but that's uh that's some G shit, man. <laughs> I wouldn't I be mean, surprised from Cannonier. He's such a weirdo and he's like dude, so he, intense. He face planted like yeah yeah. He is a weirdo, dude. I, but I loved his like brand of weirdness before this yes, fight. Like he was saying sure. some. <laughs> like he had just taken a bunch of like mushrooms or something, but yeah, dude, I loved it. Um, get the mic on that guy again, but yeah, yeah. yeah imp impressive stuff from Whitaker, man. His reflexes are just insane. Um, he trusts his counters. He trusts his head movement. Uh, very good. Yeah. The jab was floating out there. Um, dude, sign me up for Ad Adesanya Whitaker too. Like, you know what? I know it's probably not the sexiest match at this time, but there's no more clear number one contender than Robert Whitaker. Whitaker is such a smart dude, such a smart fighter. Um, not saying that the second fight won't go exactly the same, but I want to see it, man. I think this is the second best dude on the planet in this division. Um, still at the peak of his powers. Adesanya is the man right now. Sign me up for that fight again. Yeah, same here. And I think you you hit the nail on the head. It's not the most sexy fight right to be made right now because it's still kind of fresh in our mind what Adesanya did to, to Whitaker. But... If Adesanya wants to be that guy who fights number one contenders, you can't deny Robert Whitaker at this point. Like you, you, you really can't. Unless you want to make Whitaker fight Paulo Costa, which seems rude. Um, there's like no way to deny Whitaker. And I also think Whitaker would uh, take Costa's head off. Like yeah, I think Costa is one of those guys that's going to stand in front of Robert Whitaker and get lit up. Um, so yeah, sign me up for the rematch. I'm down with it. I mean, unless it's a John Jones fight, I don't really see anything out there for Adesanya unless Darren Till is super impressive against Jack Hermanson and Adesanya says, that's the dude I want to fight. But uh, Adesanya wants to stay active, man. I think this is the fight to make. Dana even backed it. You know, sometimes it's kind of duff, tough to get Dana's backing. But uh, yeah, sign me up, man. I, I would be probably just as excited for this rematch as I was for the first fight. And... Uh... The the like Australia, New Zealand, that part of the country has handled their coronavirus stuff very well. Um, so maybe they could have a, a a pretty full crowd, right? That could be one of the the bigger fights to having a fuller crowd when when the UFC comes back. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I would I I'm down with it. I'm still a Robert Whitaker mark. I still think he can beat Adesanya. That's an uphill battle, but this was good a good showing from him, right? You can't look at this and think he doesn't have a chance against Adesanya. Absolutely agree. Um, all right, let's fly down the rest of this card. Uh, we can kind of pick and choose what we want to talk about. Um, Alexander Volkov gets a big win over Walt Harris, stops him in the second round. Um, a lot of lot of good finishes uh, on this main card. You know, the only fight that went to a decision was Robert Whitaker and Jared Cannonier. Now that I'm like rethinking and looking at it in front of my face, yeah. um, Phil Hawes sets the world on fire. 
uh, was it, like an 18 second knockout. Absolutely mm-hmm. blitzed uh, Jacob Malkoon. Super impressive. Uh, Lauren Murphy, title shot or what, man? I mean, she's, I, I guess, after Maya. I mean, I guess. I, I think you got to go on Draj, but. Uh, she made, she made a strong point. Fight. They could do that too. And I, I don't want to see. Yeah, I, I guess I'm still I'm still on the Jessica Andrade as an immediate title contender. I guess she's had one fight now. But yeah, I think Andrade. I know Lauren Murphy would probably want to f- fight either Jessica Andrade or fight for a title before her. But yeah, rebook the Calvillo fight, especially because Shakirova here, nobody knew about her, right? This doesn't really move Murphy forward no, a lot at all in the division. But it gets her an impressive win, right? She right. keeps the ball rolling in a fight that... Uh, you know, we've seen other fighters stumble in. You know, it's a risky fight to take, and uh, she passed it with flying colors. But, uh, yeah, I don't think she's getting the next title shot. Um, <laughs> Magomed Ankalaev and Jan Kutilaba finally rematch, and uh, I would say the ref definitely wanted to make sure the finish was a finish because <laughs> um, Kutilaba got put the fuck out. But, yeah. uh, dude, I am very high on Magomed Ankalaev. He's got a very um, slick skill set. He's a great counter puncher. He's fast. He's got great reflexes. He's definitely a guy to keep your eye on uh, in that light heavyweight division. Oh, for sure. Big frame, too. And, yeah, like, even in this fight, it seemed obvious, like, uh, Kudalaba was having some success early, but it was one of those fights where you could tell um, Ankalaev was, like, just gathering information. Like, he was not really getting hit very hard at all early going on. Kudalaba was going a little crazy early on. Um, and it just seemed like, yeah, this this Uncle I have guy is on a totally different level. Yeah, and for beast. sure, I mean, he was ranked 11. I'm that may might move him up, even though Kudalaba was unranked. But yeah, light heavyweight coming up still, still coming up with with more talent for sure. Dude, there's some bangers in that division. Mm-hmm. Some bangers. Some of these guys are nasty. Not household names, but they are nasty. Um, Ty to Ivasa gets a big win over Stefan Struve. Uh, Ty Dewey Vasa had some funny moments. I was kind of telling you about this, uh, you know, for whatever sick reason. I want to uh, talk about it. Ty Dewey Vasa puts out a video. This man got so drunk doing shoeies and <laughs> drinking whatever else he was doing. This man pissed the bed. Uh, <laughs> watch the video. I think it's funny. He's like stumbling around it. But uh, he's got a fun personality, man. He's not the best fighter. But uh, I really like the whole shoey thing. I like his personality. He seems like he has a lot of fun. But he also looks very good since he moved to AKA. This is a big win for him. Yeah, I was going to say I actually thought he looked pretty fucking good here. Like, pretty – not like a world beater. He still was, like, not punching Stefan Struve's head – or body for some reason. Like, he would be right in front of him, like, punching above, and I'd be like, yeah. go to the body. <laughs> but I do – honest, swear to God, I think he's, like – I'm not going to say Tai Tui Voss is going to be a perennial top 10 guy, but I think he – especially at heavyweight, I could see him one of these times going on like a three fight run and we'll be like, holy shit, is Tai Tuivasa going to fight for a title? Like, cause heavyweight has those guys where they kind of come out of nowhere. Yeah. He looked, I thought he looked actually pretty, pretty good here. Yeah, he did. He looked really good. Yeah. Um, it got, definitely got some back on track. Uh, Casey Kenny, Nathaniel Wood, bravo, man. Uh, Great I think that, Great yeah, fight. outside of the top two fights, that was the fight that I was most looking forward to. And these two guys delivered, what a damn fight. Super high pace. Loved every second of it. Incredible fight. Like, incredible pace yeah, from both It was guys. so good. Super yeah. technical. Um, it's a wild fight. Bravo to those two guys. Um, and then a couple, you know, Shakvat Rachmanov looked very good. A lot of people were high on him coming into this. Submits Cowboy Oliveira. Um, Miranda Maverick makes her debut. Gets a... a Nasty stoppage over Liana Joshua. Um, I posted the picture online. I thought that picture was one of the coolest pics I've seen of Joshua's. Literally, like her nose, like split in half with like blood leaking off her face. Um, crazy, impressive yeah. stuff. Maverick. Yeah, she has good. She her striking is coming along very nicely. She was at least during in, most of her Invicta days, well, pretty well thought of as like a wrestler grappler, but clearly she's got more than that. Yeah, she looks really good, man. Um, all right. I'm about ready to close the book up on 254. You got anything else on that card? That's it, man. I think we covered it. Yeah. Some crazy stuff happening this weekend. Uh, kind of set the world on fire, man. Not only in MMA, but all around the world, man. You saw the uh, – it's just a test of the reach that Khabib has, right? Yeah. Um, people from all walks of life were uh, talking about this fight. It was uh, 
It's good to see. It was a big card too. This was one of those cards where my like casual, casual fans texted me that Absolutely. morning, like, like what time does the pay per view start? I'm thinking about buying it, and that's Khabib. That's all Khabib, dude. Yeah. By the way, love the 2 p.m. start time. I wish that could happen Ooh. more. <laughs> it's like watching NFL Sunday, right? Like you're just chilling, watching the fights, man. It's great. Dude, I woke up and like made breakfast as the prelims were playing. That was the best. I know some people probably like their like their Saturday night ritual or whatever, but yeah, dude, being done by like dinner time, loved it. Yeah, it was awesome. I, I loved it as well. I wish they would do it more for pay per views. Yeah. Um, all right, time to jump to this weekend. Uh, man, we got a card on Halloween night. It's headlined by Anderson Silva taking on Uriah Hall it should be Anderson Silva's last fight. Um, I got mixed feelings about this one, man. It, it's, it's, it's always uh, like a spectacle, even in the later years, hearing Anderson Silva walk to the cage, seeing him walk to the cage. But uh, I don't know if, if at this point in his career, at his age, this is the right fight for him. Um, Uriah Hall is like that guy that in one fight, he could look like he's going to be the next middleweight champion of the world. And then the next fight, he looks like he belongs nowhere <clears throat> near the top 15, right? Like, he's so unpredictable. Dude, he's he's a guy, to take that even a step further, he's a guy who one round looks like he should be fighting for a title shot. And then the next round looks awful. Like, he is so up and down and unpredictable, literally like round to round, that it's so uh, so hard to get a read on him. It is. Um and these guys were supposed to fight like what two years ago, I believe. Oh, and it fell throw, maybe maybe even less than that. But uh, I don't know. Do you do you like this fight for Silva as as what's supposed to be his last fight, or, or I, you know, I, do you think this should have went a different route? I would have been a fan of more of like a veterans style route. I mean, Uriah Hall is also like not really a spring chicken anymore. He's he's definitely, and he's not like a highly ranked middleweight or anything like that, but. I don't know. I mean, I, I don't have any names off the top of my head, but I would have liked somebody who's like very, very close to the end of their career as you well. You know who would have been a really cool name for this spot? Chris Weidman. I would have I would have been down with right? that. Like, yeah, I, I mean, Weidman. I, go ahead. There's a lot of guys. I was going to say I would have been down with like Robbie Lawler at middleweight. I would have been yeah. down with a lot of guys like that. Weidman, I'm sure Adesanya, or not Adesanya, I'm sure Anderson Silva wants to get Weidman back. Sure. He wants to get him back. Cause we, you know, we already went down to like the, I don't know, man. It's, it's crazy it, that, you know, if you look at his record too, man, it's, he, he's won one fight since 2013. Yeah. You know, yeah. and, and this, this guy, and that was UFC 153 was his last win. I mean, uh. I'm sorry, UFC 208, and then previous to that was UFC 153 over Stefan Bonner. It's been a long time since we, you know, he had the Nick Diaz win that was overturned, right? But yeah. it's been a long time since we've really seen Anderson Silva successful. And if this is like his last fight, eh, man, it's rough. Yeah. I mean, he can't, if there's a striker that he can style on, he could definitely. Uriah Hall could style on Anderson Silva. That's the scary part, right? Guess, Uriah yeah. Hall could could like head kick Anderson Silva into another dimension. But also, you know, he's probably not going to take Anderson Silva down. He's going to stand in front of Anderson Silva. He might, if I was going to think of somebody who's a bit of a head case and might be a little afraid to fight somebody like Anderson Silva, it's Uriah Hall, right? Um, yeah. Maybe I'm talking myself into picking uh, Anderson Silva to actually win this fight. But yeah, and even dude, even that 2017 win against Derek Brunson that that Silva had was super dubious decision there. Um, so yeah, it, very, it, you, ha true. you have to go back to UFC 153 to basically find a, a fight that Anderson Silva was dominant in. I thought he won the Michael Bisping fight. I thought he was pretty damn impressive in that one. That was a close so fight. Th they kind of flip flopped the Bisping and the Brunson win, although yeah. he never should have won that Brunson win. The Bisping one was close. Yeah. Um, yeah, and maybe I'm just like completely underrating Anderson Silva here. Um, I just don't like how he's looked all that much. I mean, he looked okay against Adesanya. The Jared Cannonier fight was super weird. Um, he's 45 years old, but yeah, I think if there is a guy that could possibly get in his own head about fighting Anderson Silva, it is De uh, Uriah Hall, right? Um, it's just, you know, and, and maybe this is my fault for always wanting like that, uh, 
that fairy tale ending for like my favorite guys, right? For the legends, it usually doesn't happen. You know, that's what makes like Khabib this weekend so special, right? Like he's going on yeah. top. Like we don't have to see him losing five, six, seven fights in a row. GSP went out on top. You know, man, BJ Penn's my guy. Like that's always been my guy. And like, dude, the heartbreak of seeing that man constantly just go out there and and just get destroyed. Ugh. Yeah. It's a heartbreaker, man. And and I just don't want to see that for Anderson. Dude, like I don't I'm, want to be a Debbie Downer either. I, my, I apologize. No, it's okay, dude. On on my like last week, I was talking about how we're gonna see Anderson Silva lose to Uriah Hall in his last fight for sure. But I'm gonna talk. If I have to make a pick, I'm gonna go with like my heart over my mind. My mind is telling me that yes, Anderson Silva looked has looked pretty bad lately. That Cannoneer fight, he looked. Yeah, he got a weird leg injury, but he looked so out of it against Cannoneer. Um, Obviously, he's like way past his prime, but yeah, I'm gonna, I'm going to convince myself that Uriah Hall gets in his own head. He's afraid of Anderson Silva. He stands still in front of Silva. Silva does some cool kick. Um, if I have to pick, I'm gonna say Silva by knockout. But I'm gonna be watch. It's gonna be one of those where like you, you are afraid to watch as it's going on. You know, I don't want to see Silva get knocked out by a guy like Uriah Hall. Just think of like the difference in like the mind if Silva gets a big win here. And just, like, puts the bow on, like, what was an absolutely yeah. incredible career that was just, like, you know, it, it didn't – the last couple of years had been rough, but, like, that would just come full circle and really, you know, put a nice bow on this guy's career who is still a legend in the sport. Um, I'm going Anderson Silva too, man. I think he lands that, uh, you know, back to shades of Vitor Belfort. Yeah. I think he throws one of those, uh, you know, front teeps to the face, catches uh, Uriah Hall, like you said, sleeping a little bit in front of him puts them away and uh the spider goes on, on top man yeah i fuck with it i would also be totally in love with anderson silva uh finishing uriah hall by submission in this fight like dropping him and then getting in some weird scramble and then locking up like a rear naked or Triangle something or something crazy because people yeah. sleep on silva's finish like submission finishes too like uh you know that's that's a huge part of his game i feel like was his ground game yeah it would, it would be, I agree, it would man. be poetic. It would be perfect. I hope it happens. I hope he gets that fucking beautiful finish to, to end a career. I think so too. I, th I think I'm kind of underrating him a little bit here. I think, uh, I think he's going to be well prepared. I think he's going to have fun out there and, uh, you know what, whatever happens, I mean, I hope he wins. Try not to be too biased, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll see. Uh, your eye hall could be a good opponent for him. Um, but yeah, I mean, Look at that. You might go back to back weeks of two of the all time sports greats uh, retiring, right? And you also get the trickle down effect of GSP. Like, you realize you're never going to see GSP fight again. You're never going to see Anderson Silva fight again. You never see Khabib fight again. Yeah. You know? It's it's time, man. Keeps keeps on fucking going, unfortunately, for, for legends of the sport. We still got, like, Fedor is still fighting. He's probably has one, maybe two more fights. Um, BJ Penn is super sad to think about. Jose Aldo is still relevant. I'm I'm just thinking of like all time greats that we that we have right now. Pretty soon, John Jones, Mighty Mouse, those guys are going to be leaving the sport probably. Yep, it's crazy, man. Time flies. Yep. Um. All right, we could briefly look down the rest of this event. I really like the co-main event. It looks like Andre Feely taking on Bryce Mitchell. Bryce Mitchell's looked really good lately. Andre Feely is another one of those guys that uh. Almost like Uriah Hall, like he flip flops so much, you know, fight to fight where he looks great and then he looks uh, kind of mediocre. Um, really hope this fight hits the map because these guys both have really good grappling. Um, I'm going Bryce Mitchell here. I think he keeps the ball rolling. He looks really good. I actually like Andre Feely. I think he's he's still improving. I think myself included, a lot of us kind of wrote him off like maybe four or five fights ago. I feel like he was one of those guys that alternated win loss win loss. Um, but he is fucking huge for 145. I think he has really good wrestling. Um, I think he's going to largely be able to either keep it off the mat or um, if it does hit the mat, stay safe and um, do do some good kickboxing type stuff on the feet. Yeah, agreed. Uh, it should be a fun feely or Bryce Mitchell. Kevin Holland's on this card. Greg Hardy's on this card taking on Maurice Green. Um, still in the Greg Hardy business. See how he looks. A lot less... Uh, spotlight on him in this fight yeah. he kind of flew under the radar this time i think they're finally going to uh 
let that chill, let him fight, and uh, see where it goes from there. Yeah, well, they realized, like, he's not that great yet. He might be, no. like, obviously he's a really good athlete, uh, but they, like, realized, like, why are we pushing this guy who is not in very good fights? Yeah, right. Agreed. <laughs> um, possibly, uh, don't sleep on this fight, but Bobby Green, Tiago yeah. Moises, opening up that main card. This is a good-ass fight, man. Tiago really Moises. Fight. Tiago Moises had that, uh, like, Achilles lock on Michael yeah. Johnson earlier in the year. Yep. I'm super excited to see him fight again. Bobby Green's looked really good lately, too, and he's been super active. He's always been uh, – always seemed like he had the talent. He just could never really put it fully together, yeah. but uh, he looks really good lately. Three wins in a row. It's going to be a fun fight. Yeah, for sure. The uh, the quarantine king, right? What do they call him? He's, he's yeah, had yeah. a bunch of yeah. fights now. Uh, sign me up for this. I didn't. That's that's another one that flew is flying way under the radar. Um, yes. That's one I'll for sure tune in for live. Yeah, and then uh, Chris Gutemaker, Alex Hernandez on this card. Um, pretty fun card, man. A couple big fights: Sean Strickland, Jack Marshman should be solid. Um, Dustin Kobe, Jared, uh, Justin Ledet. Uh, yeah, not bad. Yeah, I mean, really, everybody's tuning in for Anderson Silva. Let's yeah. be honest. And then Thursday night, right? We're back mm-hmm. to Thursday night. We got a uh, a big Bellator card. Another fight that is weirdly kind of flying under the radar. I guess when uh, you know, so much has been poured into UFC 254 and everything surrounding that, uh, fights like these get kind of uh, you know, sucked in and forgotten about. But Gegard Mousasi taking on Douglas Lima in the main event for the 185 pound title. Uh, Douglas Lima, one of the best welterweights on the planet, taking on Gegard Mousasi, one of the best middleweights on the planet. Two of Bellator's best guys, uh, pound for pound, going at it. This is a really good fight, man. I don't really have a big read on this one. I think uh, it's going to be interesting to see how Lima looks at 185. I don't think Mousasi is too big of a 185-pounder, and I think Lima's frame could lend him to be pretty solid at 185. Um, Both great strikers, both good on the mat. I don't know, man. This is a really good fight. Yeah, I'm pretty hyped about it. Um, I'm pretty. I've always been pretty high on on Douglas Lima. I mean, I think there was one point before Usman looked so fucking good in his last couple of fights where I was co- pretty confident that Lima was the best welterweight on the planet. He still might be. Um, I mean, I think it's. Belief. I think we're gonna see Musasi kind of try to do what he did to Rory McDonald, um, which is get the fight to the mat and, and beat him up there. Um, I'm not sure that's going to be super easy against uh, against Douglas Lima. I'm if I had to bet, I think Lima's going to land a ton of low leg kicks on Musasi and and outpoint him over the course of five rounds. But if Musasi gets on top, I mean, he hasn't looked super super dominant in his Bellator run, but still, if he gets on top, he's a great ground and pound artist. He's a pretty good takedown artist, even. Um, but yeah, I love Lima. I think he becomes a two weight champion here. Uh, I'm I'm in the same boat as you, man. I think he's uh. Leg I kicks. think he is leg up kicks. there. Yeah, dude, his leg kicks are insane, man. And uh, I'm with you, man. I think he's one of the best welterweights in the world. I think he can hang with any of those guys in the UFC, including Kamari Usman. Um, yeah, and Musasi hasn't looked that impressive in his Bellator run as of yet. Um, and, you know, he's he just seemed very, like, almost disinterested, right? Uh, I'm going oh, like, Lima here. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going Lima. I think he gets it done. I think he gets it done in an impressive fashion. It should be an awesome fight. I'm really pumped for it. Yeah, I hope Lima. I hope Lima picks him apart. I could see it starting kind of slow. Like I could see the first two rounds being not super exciting. But I think once Lima gets his leg kick game going um, and realizes that he has much faster hands than Musasi, that I think Lima will gradually kind of take over that fight. Yeah, it should be good, man. And I love Thursday nights. I'm off this Thursday. Can't <laughs> wait. You know, the card under it is pretty damn good too. Um, but I think we got like. As we go through this card, we have to talk about Bellator's placing really quick because the way this is listed, and I'm looking at this on SureDog, and I believe it's listed the same way on Tapology. It's got Henry Corrales versus Brandon Gertz as the co-main event. Um, solid fight, right? It's got Vita Ortega versus Desiree Yanez, Bobby Volker, Saba Homasi, Nick Newell, Zach Zane as the top, like, five fights, right? And then if you look towards the bottom of the card, you have Jake Hager, Jack Swagger, whatever you want to call him. Um, Jared Scoggins making his debut, who is a uh, very talented. You have Adam Boric as the second fight of the card. Like <laughs> he, this, he this, should be this your stud. It's weird, man. Like he should be your stud. Nick Newell should be your stud. 
And then uh, how do you not put Jack Swagger on the main card? Like, what? <laughs> yeah. I It's got to be some shit like they're trying to get people to download the Bellator app or go to their YouTube channel. That's the only explanation I can think of it. Because, yeah, it seems totally... Seems, no, yeah. no disrespect to Vita Arteaga or Bobby Volker and Saba Homasi. Like, yeah, there's you have bigger names on this card. I would think they'd be pushing Adam Boric really hard. I mean, he only has one loss to a former champion yep. in his fucking career. Um, and on, even a guy like Taylor Johnson, who's not a well-known name, he's coming off that heel hook over Ed Ruth. Like, yeah. you'd think Impressive. Bellator would think, oh, shit, we should be pushing this guy. Like, I don't... I don't understand their their bout order, especially yeah, putting Jack Swagger that low on the card. It's like, what's the point? Like nobody nobody is tuning in. Like people just want to turn on their TV and see him if they want to see him. You know what I mean? Like they're not Bellator fans are not like tuning in for the early prelims just right. to see how how good uh, Jake Jack Hager Swagger does. looks. Yeah, <laughs> put him on the main card. That's that's why you have him on the roster. You know, the good thing is we're naming off all these names, talking about all these fights. Like, this really is a good card. Um, yeah. As long as it all sticks together, there's some really solid fights. We just named a bunch of prospects to keep your eye on, and then that main event is uh, two of the best in the world going at it. So Bellator Thursday night, um, really good card. Don't miss it. Yeah, I'm about it for sure. All right, let's uh, let's go to some odds and ends before we get out of here. Um, I think one of the biggest stories – that happened this past week and it's been unfolding for a while is uh Leon Edwards, right? We've mentioned Leon Edwards a bunch. Um he's on an eight fight win streak, but he has not fought in in what uh year and a half now, probably, right? I mean his last fight was on the same card as Mastodal when he got the you know the three piece and the biscuit. And uh I don't know if it's it's him uh pricing himself out or, or not taking fights or, you know, the UFC is not wanting to promote him, but something is not lining up where this guy could just not get a fight. He couldn't fight anybody. Um, he's turning down Steven Thompson. Uh, apparently, you know, in his defense, he was supposed to fight Tyron Woodley in a fight that Gilbert Burns ended up getting because of COVID. And I do think Leon Edwards would have beaten that version of Tyron Woodley. And we could be looking at him in a completely different light, but that's how it goes in this sport. You got to fight to stay relevant, but he does have a fight coming up. Um, before we talk about the fight, what are your thoughts on how this all transpired for Leon Edwards? I, it's shitty, man. I think the, the, and I should also add, in addition to the Woodley fight being taken away from him, he was offered, I believe, a shot at Usman. Um, but I think it was super short notice, and he kind of thought, like, no, I'm not going to take this this title fight. If this is my only chance, I don't want to squander it and have it on short notice. Um, yeah, he got fucking screwed. And right, if I have the timeline correctly, he was removed from the rankings ever so briefly and then <laughs> put back into the rankings um, for this Chimaev fight. So... It's unfortunate, man. Like, I get it. He's not a star. I get it that, like, he doesn't really have a lot of um, bargaining power here because not a lot of people know who he is. Um, but at a certain point, man, I hope the UFC just kind of realizes, hey, like, you know, having having an order, a pecking order to things that makes sense will also help you uh, get fans. Because if they if the UFC fans know, all right, if I watch this Leon Edwards guy and he wins, eventually I'm going to see him fight for a title. If they don't know that's the case, they're less likely to care. Even though, like I said, he's not the most interesting or exciting guy. I think he's got the perfect fight though. I think right now, dude, Shamayev is the flavor of the month. Everybody's on this guy. He he's people outside of the MMA bubble are talking about him. He's sitting there, uh, in fight Island next to Dana white. <laughs> Um, I think this is the guy, man. He's unranked, but he's got all the steam behind him. If you want to take a fight against someone that's going to give you a lot of relevance at this time, dude, this is the guy to do it. Strike while the iron's hot. And I think for the UFC, you're putting Chemaev, who is unranked, against the number three guy in the world. Like, this guy, if he wins this fight, he is skyrocketed. Yeah. And, dude, make no mistake about it. They put Leon Edwards back into the rankings so that if Chemaev beats him, they can then give Chemaev the number three ranking. Yep. Cause that like he was taken out, like they took Leon Edwards out of the rankings to be like punish him, I guess for being difficult or what, or whatever. Um, but then put it, 
put him back in. And yeah, we all know that the lines of inactivity vary greatly from person to person, right? I think McGregor was in the rankings for like two years of inactivity. Still is. Brian Ortega <laughs> just just fought as the number one ranked guy, and he hadn't fought in almost two yeah. years. So obviously they're punishing Edwards, but then as soon as he agrees to fight Chimaev back in the rankings because they want Chimaev to be able to take that ranking if he wins, which I think you and I probably agree that Leon Edwards should pretty easily win this fight. I think that's my take, at least. Initially. I don't know. I don't I mean, know how good Chimaev is. The, dude, the tape looks excellent. The tape before the UFC looked excellent. Yeah. But it's not. Experience. It's not the, the, yeah, yeah. It's not the caliber of, of, of guys. I mean, this is a huge huge step up, but he looks confident. Um, I mean, dude, he, I was almost talked into, you know, I bet on, on Gerald Mearshart last fight. I yeah. was, I was, I was yeah. in the belief that Gerald Mearshart had a good shot to win that fight. And, uh, dude, he got knocked out with one punch. I mean, yeah, I don't know, but dude, I love this fight and I think it's a great fight for Leon Edwards, man. I think if he is that dude, he should be able to run through Chamayev. Or I can't say run through because Leon Edwards doesn't really run through anybody. But uh, <laughs> he should be able to beat Chamayev. And if you beat Chamayev and go on a nine fight win streak, yeah. I mean, well, it's, I don't think it's like a big fight for Leon Edwards, but for him, unfortunately, it's maybe the best fight he could get. I think, you know what I mean? Is, yeah. I think he's like, yeah, this, this is an entertainment, unfortunately. Or fortunately, I think more often than not, I like that this is like an entertainment type of sport. Um, and Leon Edwards has got to realize, hey, I'm not the most popular guy. Like, that's how the cookie crumbles. I'm going to get tough fights to get to a title shot. Um, yeah. I'm not Conor McGregor on the mic. That's just how it goes sometimes. Dude, sometimes you got to do it the hard way. But uh, oh. I think it's a good fight for him. I, I really like the booking. Uh, I'm excited for it. And uh, I do. I don't know. Like. <laughs> Here's a, does Shamayev get a title shot if he wins this fight? Like, is that is that the thing that's going to happen? Oh fuck, that's a good question. If he wins this fight, I could see him. I could see him fighting somebody like um, Masvidal or like a Nate Diaz or something like that. Some other non-title but big name fight. Yeah, it's crazy. This guy has like literally Scott. It, it almost feels like Conor McGregor, man. You know he doesn't talk yeah. as much as Conor McGregor, but he has those like what, like those little uh, like smashing people and all those zingers, and people have really like clinged on to this man. Yeah, people like him for sure. He's just I still even if he beats Leon Edwards here on, in a main event fight, I still think they would want to put him in front of the cameras a little bit more um, to promote him before they rush him into a title shot. I mean, we'll see, man. Uh, it, it's it's good because you know I I thought that was a shocker they took. Took Leon Edwards out of the rankings, but again, it, does it surprise me? Absolutely not. They do yeah. whatever they want. It doesn't make sense. For sure. Um, we see guys that have been retired for four years come back and get tired. Of that. So <laughs> who knows point. with the UFC's uh, matchmaking machine, but it's crazy. Yeah, for sure. Um, hey, dude, one more fight. I just want to mention really quick. I'm sure you saw it. I'm pumped about it. Marlon Moraes taking on Rob Font. Yes. Later this year. Banger of a fight. Love yeah. that fight. New England, that's a big opportunity for the New England cartel, right? Yeah, like, man. that's a winnable it's, fight for Rob Font. It is. Um, against a total killer. A long-time guy at the top of that division. Huge fight for Rob Font. I'm just waiting for him, dude. Waiting for him to sign Calvin Cater and Max Holloway. That's the one they got to make. Oh, fuck. One, that division is so good. So good. So good. I yeah. know, man. Both of every, every Every fight that comes together is basically awesome. Uh, I don't think we missed anything, man. I think we, we pretty much, pretty much covered it all. This was a, this is a big week and a historic week. Uh, you know, when a guy like that retires and leaves the sport on top in the way that he did, um, it really sends shockwaves down the sport all around it. Uh, but props to Khabib, man, super impressed with him and, uh, good luck in the rest of your career or I shouldn't say career, the rest of your uh, life and whatever you go to do. No idea what he's going to do, if he's going to be getting into coaching, or maybe he takes a grappling match eventually. But uh, good luck to Khabib, man. Yeah, for sure. Um, that's all I got, dude. So until next week, as always, we appreciate you guys listening. Please shoot us a follow online. Hit that subscribe button on YouTube. And we'll talk to you all next week. Enjoy the fights. Face the pain.